Hello, I'm Jan Newharth, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Welcome to First Five Now, a Freedom Forum conversation series that explores topical issues and features current newsmakers who are using the five freedoms of the First Amendment to guide their work. Today, we are pleased to present a panel discussion centered around the new documentary, Raise Your Voice, which follows the student journalists at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, navigating their school's mass shooting as both survivors and journalists. The documentary explores youth free speech history in America, connecting the Parkland, Florida students to a broader story about young voices and their power through social movements. This program is brought to you by the Freedom Forum, which fosters First Amendment freedoms for all. Our vision is an America where everyone knows, understands, values, and defends the freedoms of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. And now please welcome our moderator, John Maynard. And thank you, Jan. Uh, welcome to First Five Now. I am John Maynard, Senior Director of Programs for the Freedom Forum. And I'm privileged to serve as your moderator as we discuss the making of the documentary, Raise Your Voice and the connection to the First Amendment. We are joined by three key people involved with the film. Mary Beth Romslow is the film's director, cinematographer, editor, and executive producer, whose award-winning films have played at festivals across the globe. Her most recent projects include the documentary series, Handmade Mostly, for Reese Witherspoon's new media platform called Hello Sunshine, and a conceptual dance film titled Kitchen Dance about women and their work. Also joining us is Mary Beth Tinker, who appears in the film and represents the link between student free speech rights from the 1960s until today. She's known for her role in the 1969 Supreme Court case Tinker versus Des Moines, which set a precedent for students' rights to free speech in schools and she continues to educate young people about their rights, speaking frequently to student groups across the country. Also joining us is Rebecca Schneid, who during her junior year at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, survived and reported on the tragic mass shooting at her school. In her senior year of high school, she served as co-editor in chief of the school newspaper, The Eagle Eye. Her work has been published in The Guardian, The Orlando Sentinel, The South Florida Sentinel and other publications and she is currently on the staff of the Duke Chronicle at Duke University. Welcome all, and also welcome to all our Freedom Forum members who are tuning in, and thank you for your continued support of all that we do. Before we start the conversation, let's watch the trailer for Raise Your Voice. A heartbreaking day in Florida, and sadly an all too familiar one. This is the fourth shooting at a middle or high school just this year. Writing about the victims and being a journalist was my outlet. Journalists present this information to you. You know, here is this problem, and then you're hoping that the public is going to look at that and say, oh, that's horrible. Let's not let that happen ever again. So raise your voice for the ones who can't anymore. We are mad. We were angry that it happened to us. We were normal students <laughs> before all of this happened. Like we, we went through something traumatic and like this is us trying to make change because of it. No, we can't keep standing still. Small actions by ordinary people are really what makes history. Look what good that's done. I figured out later that you can do things that make a difference even while you're scared. If now is not the time to make a change, then when is it? These aren't just kids practicing their First Amendment rights, they're living them. Our 
Uh, Mary Beth Romslow, let, let's start with you. Um, tell us the genesis of the film and, and why you decided to pursue this, this project. Uh, sure. Um, you know, m like much of the country on February 14th, of 2018, I was watching the news about what was happening, what had happened at St Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and I was horrified and um, heartbroken that this keeps happening in our country. Um, and I saw um, journalism teacher Melissa Falkowski talking to Anderson Cooper, and she just, she gripped me with, with how she talked about how she hid students in the closet for two hours, her newspaper team, and how they report, they were already starting to report and talk about the, the, the tragedy as journalists, even in the moment. Um, and so I just reached out to Melissa and said, I'm an independent filmmaker, and I'm curious about your story, and I wanna you know, explore doing something about, um, about what your students are doing to report on, report on the tragedy at your school. And we kind of, it kind of grew from there. Um, I ended up meeting the students for the first time at March for Our Lives in DC, actually at the museum. And uh, the, the story kind of unfolded. I knew I wanted to tell something about the power of young voices, but it, it kind of took a while to sort of figure out how all the pieces came together. But that's where it began. Yeah, yeah, and you, you do tell the stories, of course, of these brave, brave student journalists, one who we're gonna meet in just a moment, but you also did wanna expand the story to the importance of, of student free speech and student journalism. So tell us why you kind of went on, on that path. Well, you know, it, it, it's interesting because I think that the story sort of evolved that way. I think initially I thought maybe it might be more about the guns issue and, mm -hmm. and reporting on guns and, and the impact that these students were having on the conversation. Um, I have, I lost a cousin to gun violence years ago. And so it was sort of personal that that was my first instinct on the angle. But as I can, kind of continued to listen, it really became clear that these students really understood that in order to make a change about anything, whether that's the Second Amendment or any amendments or, or any cause that you care about, you have to have your First Amendment freedoms fully intact and understood and exercise them in order to make a change. So it kind of evolved more into being about First Amendment rights. And it really came because I met Mary Beth Tinker also on that first trip. And these, these worlds, you know, the sort, sort of story serendipity <laughs> started to collide. Um, and it was the 50th anniversary of her court case that year. And so some things just started to unfold that it became much more clear that this was really a film about First Amendment rights and, for young people. Right. Rebecca, uh, the first scenes of the documentary follow um, you and your, 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 your fellow student journalists attending and reporting on the March for Our Lives rally, which occurred so soon after the, after the shootings. Um, tell us what it was like to first watch this documentary uh, some, you know, two years, two and a half years later, and looking back at those days. Yeah, I think the first time that I actually first watched it was, um, I think it was like a year or so afterwards. I think Mayor Beth sent it to me and I, and I watched it. And I remember I was, I was, it's so odd just because I think, um, I don't remember much of those of the, the mar I don't remember very much of any of those months. Um, I don't remember really uh, the march specifically either. But I think that looking back at it, like my mindset was so different. I've grown so much. I would that was I was sixteen, I think, when I first met you, and I'm nineteen now. Um, and then maybe for a lot of people, it feels like the shooting was so soon, it was so recently, but really that was like, it feels like ages ago. Um, and I was a very different girl. And I think that obviously my youth was ripped away from me and like my aging was accelerated um, for reasons. And maybe I have matured more so because of that. But at the same time, I think it's, it's personally, so interesting to just like look back at that and watch it and like remember my mindset um and like put me back into that space um and I have and like I think that I in the in the months afterward afterwards after the shooting I was talking about it so much um and I was like and and I was talking to so many people about it so like I remember I don't know my my interactions with Mary Beth in, in the beginning weren't as they were just kind of a drop in the in the bucket, to be quite honest, of like all the things that I had. And then, but then she stayed with us. Um, and she, I, I, we, you came with us to 
to multiple different things my junior and senior year. And then I got to know you and your whole team more. And um, it feels more like a journey that that's really authentic to my uh, last couple years of high school um, in some really important moments. And I feel, yeah, I think that it's, it's hard when so much of those months and like my high school time, I don't remember. And it's hard for me to like think about. So it's really great to kind of look back at that and like have something there that, that, that shows it. And it's also, yeah, I mean, sometimes I like look back at that. I'm like, I like cringe at some of the things that I say because I was 16 years old and I don't know, but it's, it's really cool though. And I think that Mary Beth did a great job and I, so I feel really grateful um, to have been a part of it and to have met her. Well, you come across very poised in the whole, in the whole film, believe me. <laughs> <Thank so. you. laughs> um, Mary Beth Tinker, um, you have a starring role in this film, uh, which we'll talk about. Uh, but for those who might not know about your landmark Supreme Court case, um, could you just give us a, a brief summary and why it was so monumental to, to this country? Thank you, John. It's so good to be here with you and Rebecca and Mary Beth. And I'm a fan of the Freedom Forum. and the First Amendment rights that you protect and, and advocate for, those are rights that young people have used through our history and are using now today so much to advocate for their own interests. And that's what we were doing also in 1965 when we wore black, us kids, we wore black armbands to school to mourn the dead in Vietnam and to call for a Christmas truce that year. We had been inspired uh, in one way, for sure, by the kids in Birmingham, Alabama and other kids of the civil rights movement who were speaking up against racism. And so in 1965, when we wore black armbands to school, I was in eighth grade and um, some of the others were in high school. And for that, we were suspended. And so the American Civil Liberties Union took the case to court and it lost at the district court, it lost at the appeals court. But in 1969, the Supreme Court, uh, with Abe Fortas writing this beautiful ruling on what education should be in democracy, wrote that um, students do have First Amendment rights in public school, the right to express themselves. And they wrote that students are persons with the responsibilities of persons and the rights of persons. And so it was a very uh, you know, important landmark decision for youth rights, for students' rights. I had no idea that it was going to be so important at the time. And also it was a group project. There was a group of students that were involved, my brother, Chris Eckhart, a, a number of other students were involved. And um, there were also some in adults that were supportive, our families for one thing and others in the community. So it was a very, important kind of community effort to stand up for the rights of young people to have a voice and to have a say in the issues that affect their lives. And it's cited today, it's been cited many thousands of times in um, situations where young people are wanting to express themselves. And gun violence is a huge area where young people are using the First Amendment. And I'm so glad they are because my career was as a nurse and my last job as a trauma nurse, especially with adolescents and with teenagers. So I took care of many kids that were shot over the years. And when I learned about the um, movement that came out of Parkland, I was so heartened to see how they turned grief into action. I'm so heartened to see how they still are. And young people are speaking up about this issue all over the country, especially now with this important election mm -hmm. coming up. So is it? important case to establish the rights of teenagers to have a voice. And I was struck by something you said in the film that, you know, you were there, you were 13 years old when you first wore the armband and you weren't really even aware that you were using your first amendment rights, correct? So um, do you think students even that at that age have a better sense of those rights today? You, you touched on that a bit, but. There's a natural desire for young people to express themselves. It even starts when they're babies and then it, it grows and that can be squelched, it can be discouraged or encouraged. And when it's discouraged, it hurts all of us. It hurts the whole society because we really need the input 
of the imagination, the creativity, the sense of fairness, and the experiences of young people. The experiences that Rebecca and other students at Marjorie Stone and Douglas had are so powerful. And that experience and what they have done with that and how Mary Beth has helped with the film to tell the story is very po powerful in shaping where we're going for the future and the place that we need to be where young people are protected and are not shot and, and hurt by gun violence. Rebecca, um, you're at Duke University. Um, uh, do you think students uh, think about uh, or even appreciate their First Amendment rights? Um, I'm, I mean, I'm sure it's not something you guys talk about, you know, in, over the lunch table, even though, or the Zoom table at this point. But, you know, do, what, what, what are their thoughts on First Amendment? Like at Duke specifically, do you mean? Just in general, uh, students your age. Yeah, I mean, I think that I'm kind of, uh, I'm a journalism student student um and i mean there's no major but i'm kind of an entrenched in a bunch of the communities here so i think that we talk about that a lot as a that's like and also i'm a writer like that first and foremost and that's kind of like um where i find my power and my expression um most easily and so i think that the power to express yourself is something that i talk about a lot with people i've also gotten more into just writing not even just as a journalist but whatever you know write, writing creatively writing in whatever ways that, that feel comfortable to me at duke um and i think a lot of the places that i go we, we talk about that kind of thing and i i mean i i'm pretty confident that if the, that was ever stripped away that we would be uh, pretty vigilant in making sure that to to keep those rights we talk i think i words is something our words are something that or surround me everywhere I go here. Um, and I think that it's something that I'm more conscious of now after high school, um, but it's also just something that I'm really conscious of as a writer. And so, yeah, I think that I talk about, we talk about it in the abstract, I think that we don't necessarily, you know, like you said, it's not necessarily something that's like, we, it's something that we take for granted, I think, the ability to express ourselves um, and to have the power to do that. Um, but I think that, it's so valuable um, at school. And I think that I've been given, honestly, like college is such a liberatory experience for me in that I feel like I have so much more freedom of deciding the spaces in which I wanna speak in, and the spaces that I can be spoken to in, um, and that we can use our First Amendment rights to talk about issues, whether in the cities that we live in or in the colleges that we're in. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that overall, I've been pretty lucky in, uh, like I love Duke and I think that they've been giving us great, great opportunities to talk. Um, and, and even if the university or the institutions that we're a part of, whether that be Duke or otherwise don't necessarily give us spaces or aren't necessarily uh, encouraging that kind of free speech, I think that it's the nature of kids to make it themselves. And I, I, I'd like to think that we do that. Um, and Mary Beth Romslow, um, how does the First Amendment guide your work as a, as a documentary filmmaker, not just on this film, but all, all your other work too? Well, it's everything. I mean, I have the, I have the freedom to explore stories and, and, and tell stories and um, project stories and, and, and amplify stories. And um, there, I don't, I'm not afraid to do that. I um, feel empowered to do that. And so it's, it's kind of the bedrock, the foundation of any project that I explore. It's a really important part. Um, and especially in independent filmmaking where you kind of make your own way and you do things like this project where you start, but you're not really sure, you're not given an assignment. You kind of are, are you have the freedom to explore and make connections as you wish. And I, I feel really empowered and fortunate to be able to do that. And tell us again how you connected with Mary Beth Tink. You're both Mary Beths, by the way, yes. so that, that's just throwing everyone <laughs> off. But tell us about the connection with Mary Beth uh, Tinker for, for this film. How did yeah, you well, I mean, like I said before about story serendipity, I mean, we're both named Mary Beth, and we actually both grew up in Des Moines, too. So um, there's a lot there. And uh, I, I knew of her case. We learned about it in school growing up. And actually, my dad and his brothers went to the high school that... Um, Mary Beth's brother John went to. And so there is like a bit of a hometown story there that I was aware of. Um, but the way that I met Mary Beth was actually when the, um, the Stoneman Douglas uh, journalist had a panel at the museum uh, the day before the march. And 
Um, afterwards, Mary Beth was in the audience and she came up to speak to them. And I, I put it together like, oh, that's Mary Beth Tinker from home, my hometown. <laughs> and um, so I went up to her and I said, my name is also Mary Beth. And I also grew up in Des Moines. And she said, oh, well, I have to hug you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it kind of just started there. And we started talking about her Supreme Court case and the 50th anniversary and, oh, the Parkland students should just come in February to Iowa. And so it kind of just intersected in that way. And, and I still to this day, I have to tell a little funny story is that my, my husband's an attorney. And so that night um, after I'd met Mary Beth Tinker, I texted him and I said, do you know who Mary Beth Tinker is? And he wrote back he, right away. He was like, obviously. <laughs> and <laughs> I said, well, I met her today. And, um, she's, you know, I've got her number in my phone. And he was like, you know, he, he said, it's only one of like the 10 major cases you study your first year of law school. Like it's a big deal. And um, so he's still to this day, if like Mary Beth pops up on my phone, he's like, oh, no big deal. Just Mary Beth Tinker. <laughs> so um, we met actually at the museum. And like I said, things kind of unfolded from there. And um, we were able to have the Parkland student journalists come to Iowa in February of 2019 for the 20th or the 50th anniversary rather of, of the court case and the students created this amazing special issue about the Tinker case um, that we can share um, if it's of interest for the museum um, members and the, the people listening here but um, they really they reported on that weekend of all the things that were going on and all the issues um, connected to the Tinker case which was really special. Right. Mary Beth Tinker, uh, you continue, of course, to, to speak to students. What motivates you? What, you know, what, what, what makes you get up and, and, and go all, all over the country and, and talk to these students about, about the importance of the five freedoms? What started to motivate me recently when I was working at Prince George's Hospital on the adolescent trauma unit there, and I was just taking care of so many kids, and I have throughout my career, kids that really don't get a fair break in our society and the well-being of children and teenagers is just not the top priority of our society. And so I started thinking, is there something in my experience that I could share with young people and encourage them by example to get out there and speak up and use their rights and, and show that it's a good way of life and you can have some victories and you can meet some interesting and amazing people like I have with this project. And so, that's how I you know, was motivated. But I also had examples in my life of young people who do that. And now, of course, the, of course, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas students are examples for me. But we do need, all of us, examples because there's a tendency to self-censor yourself and to be, you know, sort of not want to get out there in front a lot of times. And so it's good to have examples of other people who do that. And so, people like the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas students, they're, they're examples to me and I'm very inspired by them, but I was motivated by trying to help whatever we can do to change conditions in our country so that they are more um, you know, beneficial for young people so that young people can thrive. And right now we have so many threats to that, whether it's the climate emergency, gun violence, COVID, the racial and economic extreme um, inequalities and so many things that young people are dealing with and, and really struggling with. Their schools closed down, so many on virtual, the you know, health and all kinds of health issues, physical health, mental, social health, all these things. So it's good to see young people advocating for themselves and that's what motivates me because it's very powerful. I can speak up for young people and adults can, but when young people speak for themselves and use their own voices, that's when it's really powerful. Right. Um, we just got a few minutes left. Um, Rebecca, I wanted to ask you, and this is the question that every college sophomore probably hates hearing, but um, are you, are you gonna be continuing your pursuit of, of journalism? I know you're on the staff of the Duke Chronicle now. Um, freedom of the press, of course, is one of the freedoms. So any, any thoughts on, on what happens next? Um. You're correct that that's the question that every college sophomore hates hearing, but uh, I'm happy to answer it um, still. Um, well, I might, so right now I, I uh, 
not only am I on the Chronicle staff, but I'm also, my job is I write about Durham at a local newspaper that runs out of the Stanford School of Public Policy at Duke, which is really cool and I love it. Um, I am perpetually confused as to what I want to do for the rest of my life. But I also, I think that throughout college, I'm kind of recognizing that I'm gonna just take it as it comes. And I know that I love to write and I know that I love to tell stories. Um, and I think that that's enough to keep me going. And eventually I'll, I don't have to know exa everything right now. Um, trying to tell myself that <laughs> every day. Um, but I, yeah, I think that I, I know that writing feels like the most natural thing for me to do. Um, and there's a reason why, I mean, I wanted to be a doctor up until like my junior year of high school. And then I was like, never mind. Um, <laughs> and I mean, our, our lived experiences and the things that, that, that we do as a result of those lived experiences are the things that drive us. Um, and they're like, uh, I don't think that, I don't think that I'd be the, the person that I am today if I wasn't so entrenched in journalism and if that wasn't something that gave me power and that gave me um, purpose. As it as it has, and so, I mean, Maribeth, you, but you, but you're doing right now that that inspires me as well. Like I, who who knows what I'm gonna end up doing? I know that I want to tell stories, um, and I think that that's yeah, that's what's gonna sustain me from now with my confusion. <laughs> Great answer, uh, Maribeth Romslow. Um, I'll give you the final words here. Uh, what do you hope people really get out of out of this this documentary? Well, um, a couple of, I mean, a couple of things. I hope that young people know and are empowered that their voices have power. They have a lot of weight and they have the right to use their voice and speak up and, 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 and say what's important to them. And I think that's really important this year, this fall, especially, um, even if they're not old enough to vote, they can influence and the, the people in their lives that do go into the voting booth. And so I think that knowing that they have a point of view that's valid, that's important, is a really big deal, um, always, but especially in a, in a big election year. Um, I think also just about the process of making the film, um, and this kind of goes to, to what you said, Rebecca, I think, I think it's okay to be uncertain sometimes in, in storytelling and, in, and in, the, in the path, because really as I started this project, I wasn't exactly sure what it, I didn't know it would turn into what it became. And I think sometimes taking a slower approach, um, there's, there's such beauty in that as a storyteller. You know, I think especially often we're, we're, we're in this fast, 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 like report it now, get it out now, tweet it now. And I think uh, I had the benefit with this project and with a lot of my projects to say, I'm just gonna sit with this for a while and I'm gonna keep listening and I'm gonna start to see where the connections unfold and where things come together. Um, and that allowed me really, I think, too, to, I, I remember in our early days at March for Our Lives and then when I came to Stoneman Douglas that spring, I remember I could tell that, that all of you students were bombarded with questions and tired of talking about it and um, traumatized. And I wanted to really respect that. And so being able to take a slower approach let me be able to do that. I knew I needed to make connection with the students and Melissa right away and be in there at the beginning and have, a, have an understanding of the beginning and have some footage from the beginning. But by being okay with the fact that it was gonna take a while to unfold, it allowed me to build relationships. It allowed me to respect their space when they needed it. Um, and I just, I, I, I remember thinking, not that these students are my kids at all, I have two young kids that aren't yet in high school, but I, I remember approaching it like I wanted, I would wanna approach it the way I'd want a, a journalist or a filmmaker to treat my kids with their story. And being able to take the time and let it be a slower story um, really allowed me to do that. So a couple lessons there, but I think the biggest one <laughs> is really that, um, that I want young people to know they have a voice and that their voice matters and um, that they should use it. Well, I wanna thank uh, Mary Beth Romslow, Mary Beth Tinker and Rebecca Schneid for, for joining us today. The film is Raise Your Voice. Uh, for more information about the film, you can go to gooddocs.net. That's G-O-O-D-D-O-C-S dot net. Or raiseyourvoicedocumentary.com, one word. Um, so thank you again. Uh, and we hope uh, our audience will tune in to our next episode of First Five Now on October 22nd at 2 o'clock. Our guest is Jack Weinberg 
whose act of civil disobedience 56 years ago helped launch the highly influential and revolutionary free speech movement. And you can always visit freedomforum.org for more information. Thank you again for joining us for today's First Five Now.